Felipe Melo is a musician, a film director, and author. He studied at the Berklee College of Music in Boston, and since then, he works as a jazz pianist, a producer, and orchestrator. He is also a comic book and graphic novel author, and his books are published in the U.S., Europe, and South America. Now, he has composed the music for films and directed music videos and award-winning short films. Today, we are here discussing his film, The Lone Wolf, an award-winning film that is sweeping the award circuit and also won a coveted Sophia Award and was on this year's Oscar shortlist. So, ladies and gentlemen, let's welcome musician, film director, and author Felipe Melo to the show. Welcome. Thank you. Such a nice introduction. I'm really happy to be here. <laughs> well, you, you deserve that. And uh, I have had the pleasure of watching your film, The Lone Wolf. So what gave you the idea to create this story? Well, uh, I guess uh, I wanted to, to, to write a script that you could actually shoot with one actor in one location in, with just one continuous shot. So that was the, the main basic idea that uh, uh, started it all. Then also, of course, I love uh, talk radio, both the movie and talk radio itself. So, so in Portugal, we still have these kinds of kind of late night shows where the callers, they basically they're like a small family. So I, I, I listened to a lot of those and those were definitely an inspiration. Of course, then there's a, the, uh, one certain call that changes the, the narrative. And for that call, I had to really have some difficult conversations during research and all that. So this well, was the idea. Yeah, well, let's, uh, let's, before we get into that subject matter, let's uh, talk about the way that you you actually filmed this. So you did it at a radio station. And was it difficult to shoot the film in just one take? Well, that's, uh, the, uh, it, it was difficult, but it was also a thrill because, I mean, when you're 18 minutes into the take, you're like, the, 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 the crew is holding hands, you know? wishing that nothing that the camera doesn't bump into anything or that the actor doesn't mess up a line so it was like uh, very very tense but a lot of fun I actually had a lot of fun shooting this film so so well how many takes did it actually uh, take you to get it right <laughs> we're talking 36 takes <laughs> What, really, thirty six uh, takes. Thirty six takes. Yeah, that's that's um, how many it took. But uh, you know, sometimes you just really have to be patient and wait for the right take. And but we 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 thought it out. It wasn't. Uh, we had two days to to get the right take. So that was so, it. And I noticed that you chose uh, Adriana Lutz for to play Victor. Why did why did you choose him? Well, in, since I, I, I had a one continuous shot, I really needed somebody who could deal with a lot of text. Uh, essentially, it's always on screen. So we needed somebody who really had some real stage experience. And Adrian Luz, uh, more than his cinematic face, which he has, is also a very experienced theater actor. And uh, I, I, I had never worked with a... Uh, somebody who's so experienced in theater, so this was like uh, driving a Ferrari, you know. Everything was easy. Uh, from day one, he had the, the text uh, memorized and everything seemed so instinctive, intuitive, you know. So. Well, for him, what, was, what did he think about the subject matter? Well, uh, as, you, as you know, this, uh, it, it's an open short, like you you can take two sides, either he's innocent or he's guilty. And I never got to know what the actor thought. I asked him and he said, I won't tell you. And I said, good call. Well, uh, I thought what I found extremely interesting, and, and ladies and gentlemen, when you have the opportunity to watch The Lone Wolf, uh, we, we've all we've all listened to talk radio late at night where callers call in uh, and you hear the 
the personal stories, you hear the relationship between the talk show host and, and the callers, but then you get that one. And I don't want to give it completely away, but it, it's a very disturbing storyline. Felipe, I will say that it's a very disturbing storyline. And you did. You left it open at the end to where, for the viewer, is he guilty? Is he innocent? But I thought the most interesting play in this short film was at the very end. When the next caller called in, it was a familiar voice. It was a friendly voice. But then it was a, a caller who voiced their support for the talk show host. And right then and there, that caller made their judgment call as to if he was guilty or innocent. And I thought that was very unusual. Um, so was that the idea, as you said, for all the ones who watch this to wonder, is he guilty or not? Absolutely, you got it, got it exactly right. I mean, um, usually I tend to write characters who are looking for some sort of redemption. You know, that's a classic because I, I grew up watching a lot of American cinema. And uh, I noticed a very clear transition between the, the films of the 70s and the films of the 80s. Uh, in the 70s, you tended to have, uh, I guess, more complex characters because I, I remember a lot of 70s characters that weren't looking for redemption. And sometimes they're lost people or I remember Taxi Driver and uh, Dog Day Afternoon and people in despair and they're not necessarily looking for redemption or a full circle, an arc of uh, inner peace. But then you get the 80s. I grew up in the 80s. So, so you had this kind of storyline with the hero's journey in which every time the main characters were... Uh, in fact, uh, they learned from their past experience and they became better people or uh, whatever. But I made a deliberate effort to create a character that wasn't looking for redemption. Uh, and he, he doesn't even, he doesn't seem interested in making that circle. Sometimes it's dif more difficult to, to write because you never know if the audience will empathize. But it was also an exercise on a, uh, how uh, on uh, all, we almost every time tend to empathize with the main character, regardless. Uh, and I, I, I tend to, 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 I mean, fiction nowadays plays with that a lot. And even in the, oh, sorry, sorry. But even in the real world, I mean, people tend to support their celebrity idols uh, to an extent that sometimes it's really dangerous, right? And you did. You portrayed that element in this film very, very well. And what I really liked about it was that the talk radio, the being at the radio station late at night, was a perfect location based on the storyline because he has he is in a room by himself and has one person in the control room. And then he gets this phone call live on the air. And, and it's almost like catching a criminal or, or trapping an animal in a cage. And then you're, then you're trying to create or force a narrative. And in this case, he's trying to force this guy to admit his wrongdoing and but in the very beginning, you see that, that spirit of denial right off the bat. But the caller already knew what was going to be happening. So he already set the stage for him. And, uh, but what, and it's like you did the twist. Is the confession real? Or was the confession just to get out of the situation to save his family? So it was brilliant. <laughs> I really uh, thank you so much for saying that, you know, it means a lot because just to be here talking to you, we made this short film, I mean, Lisbon, we do have a very, very small industry, so we make 
uh, of course we have great filmmakers, but uh, just to know that our little film travel and that I'm here talking about it to you, it's, uh, and that you actually got exactly what we wanted to, to convey, it's just uh, such a privilege. I really appreciate it. Yeah, it's a, it's a very, um, it's, it's suspenseful. There's a little bit of a uh, uh, thriller aspect to it. Uh, very engaging, uh, emotional, uh, and the viewer, you know, it's like you go through so many different emotions as you're watching this uh, short film unfold. And it's amazing that within, within 20 minutes time, you get this whole story in and out. Very, very powerful. You know, we don't have to sit in a theater for two hours, but to bring forth a very powerful 20 minutes. I mean, was that difficult for you to do? Well, um, I, 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 it wasn't, I love the short film format and uh, I, I do work a lot on comic books and uh, that gives you a sense of uh, narrative rhythm. Uh, so, I, 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 and I ne never thought of a short film as a, a way to make a feature, like as a concept. So I do tend to think in this format and I thought it wouldn't work if it was longer. That's what I, what I think. And uh, since we had very little time to shoot and very little money to build sets and uh, to have a, a good crew, I think sometimes limitations can really improve creativity. We have to find ways to make it interesting, or to make it look good. Uh, so a lot of people actually do complain that we, our industry doesn't have a lot of money. And that's true. If we had more money, we would make more films. But sometimes not having a lot of means uh, actually can make you think of solutions, which is... Yeah, it's, it reminds me of uh, back in the day when the music, and you would know this, the, record, you know, the music recording industry would record on tape. Now everything is done digitally. But when you record on tape, there's a lot of things that you had to, you had to think outside the box to get certain things done. So I think it caused more creativity than ever before, mm -hmm. where things maybe today, depending on the genre of music, is very easy. But, uh, but you're right. When, when you're put into a situation like doing this short film and, you, and it's not big budget, it does make you become very, very creative. But I will say this, uh, you have an excellent eye uh, for the camera, and I love the way that it was filmed. And I guess it, in a way it was filmed in the round, correct? Yeah. Uh, I, I, I thought of the camera almost as a shark circling the host. So, so, so basically, this was the whole concept. Uh, the camera is circling like a predator, circling the, like the predator. So that, that uh, definitely we had to do a lot of rehearsing in the cold winter. It was tough. Uh, but then again, it was worth it because uh, seeing the film with an audience and feeling the tension in the air is just something which is the best reward you could have. Yeah, because I believe, because uh, as I was watching the film, I'm I'm going to guess it's probably around about the ten minute mark that it finally dawned on me that you have this this circular motion of the camera, and not once that I you know, and you put it in a perfect perspective of a shark circling his prey, and that's really what happened when he got that one. A caller into his radio show. That's what it became. It became a shark circling his prey, but he wanted to get even. Exactly. That that was uh, that was it. So uh, we rehearsed and rehearsed and rehearsed until almost like a a musical score. That was what we we did. We rehearsed like I I rehearsed in a uh, band. So the camera was always at the same place on that line. Uh, so, so it was exactly like a musical score. Well, then let me ask you this, because um, working with the actor and he, he knowing his lines, uh, when it came to the camera work, did you have to test the, the speed 
of the camera as you were moving around him, uh, trying to get that perfect feel where it's not too slow, but then it's not too fast? Did you have to do multiple uh, takes in that area to figure out the, the mood of that? Absolutely. Well, we did, uh, you know, nowadays we do have a lot of advantages. And at some point, I didn't even know if I would have the, the funds to, to have a really good camera. So I thought, in last case, I'll record it with an iPhone. Because I had seen this beautiful film by, by a filmmaker called Sean Baker. He had done a film called Tangerine, shot on an iPhone. And I thought, OK, it just proved that it's possible to, to shoot a beautiful film with nothing. So we did rehearse a lot with the phone. And we did the choreography uh, so we could, when, when we indeed had a, a good camera, we would just have to redo what we had done hundreds of times. Well, what's it like? What was it like being Oscar shortlisted? Oh my! It was a, quite an emotional week because you know, uh, ever since I can remember, I've watched the Oscars with my mom. Uh, she's she's uh, uh, older now, uh, but so it's I really love the Oscars. You know, like uh, uh, so having the film shortlisted. It was an incredible surprise. And I, I'm guessing everybody says that. But in this case, uh, this couldn't be more honest because, you know, like doing a, I live in Lisbon, Portugal, and we shot in a very, very ugly place of town. So this was a small budget, small crew, and uh, I'm not even a filmmaker. <laughs> I have a daytime job as a musician. So all this was just completely unexpected. When I realized that I was on the short list, it was just, what? This is absolutely insane. So when I, I realized that I wasn't nominated, you know, like it's an emotional ride, but uh, the thrill of knowing that I was on the short list was far better than the, the deception I got when I wasn't nominated because it showed me that it's actually not that far because the Oscars were like, what? What? Is... And it isn't that distant. Uh, and sorry, I'm talking a lot, but you know, you grow up with this notion. Sometimes people say, oh, to get in the Oscars, you do need a lot of money for campaigns or you need to know people. Actually, I don't think that's, that's part of it. But I think if a movie, if a film is good, and it will always find a way. It finds a way with people. If it connects with people, uh, it, it goes, uh, it, it, it can go to the Oscars. It can go much further than you could ever imagine, you know. Well, you've won multiple awards, but you also won a Sophia Award for this film. What was that like? Oh, well, you know, it's beautiful because uh, it's the Portuguese uh, film community. Uh, in, in music, we, I always enjoy thinking that uh, if you get the respect of your pairs of your peers, uh, uh, then you're good. And, and this is like chosen by, by my fellow filmmakers in Portugal. And so how many, how many film festivals have uh, The Lone Wolf been uh, shown? Well, a few, a few. Uh, the good thing about making films is that you get to travel and you get to meet a lot of people and a few of your heroes. And so uh, actually uh, it's been around. I'm going to France in a couple of days with the film. So that's a good, a good thing about having so much work filming is that you get to go to a, a few cocktails. <laughs> <laughs> well, do, do you have, do you have a, uh, another film in mind? Whoa, okay. Now uh, I guess after all this craziness, uh, I'm, I'm going to use my my time to 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 finally do that major step of um, going to a feature. Uh, you know, I'm I'm guessing uh, filmmakers who who are watching this they'll they'll relate. It's always the that 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 phase in in which you see all the work coming ahead and you feel like that sort of inner fear. But that's the most beautiful fear because it means you're doing something that's important to you. So let's see. Well, are you going to base uh, your feature on uh, possibly one of your comic books? <laughs> oh, well, you know, uh, one good thing is that our latest comic book, 
this is like a moment of advertisement. <laughs> <laughs> Go <It's>, ahead. <laughs> we, we did release a book in, in the US uh, called Ballot for Sophie, which just got uh, 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 Universal Pictures just got the adaptation rights. So let's hope this happens. I would love to see uh, it would be for a TV show. So the TV series. Now, so now did you win? Cool. Did you win four Eisner Awards for that? <laughs> no, but I'm eternally nominated. <laughs> <laughs> it's good. It's good. It's uh, it builds character, they say. So no, actually, it was kind of the same thing as the Oscars. We did a local comic book, which was supposed to have a local edition, and suddenly I met the Eisner Awards, and there's Neil Gaiman. Uh, uh, Frank Miller and all these guys that we know from our childhood, you know, and they're announcing the award. So we lost the award, but they still, we were happy they said our name, you know, we're just like a, a fanboy mode. <laughs> well, well, Felipe, I can say this. You can call yourself a filmmaker. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, Felipe Mello's Oscar qualifying short film, The Lone Wolf, shares a story of a radio host whose show is interrupted by an unsolicited call. But I'm not going to give it away because you have to see The Lone Wolf. It is riveting. It's emotional. It's suspenseful. And in the end, it's going to be up to you to figure out, is he guilty or is he not guilty? And Felipe, hey, when you get that feature film done, you got to come back on the show. Hope so. I'll be here. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you so much for this chat. It was wonderful. Oh, it's fantastic. Great. And ladies and gentlemen, again, Felipe Mello's uh, shortlisted film, The Lone Wolf. Check it out. You're going to love it. It is a, like I said, a very uh, suspenseful 20 minutes and you'll enjoy it. It's uh, excellent filmmaking. And Felipe, I will say it again. You can definitely call yourself a filmmaker. You have done an excellent job, an excellent work. Again, brilliant. Thank you so much, really. <laughs> All right, ladies and gentlemen, Felipe Mello, film director, jazz pianist, comic book author. And as for me, stay tuned. We'll be right back after this. Mas é, é comigo, a minha vida. Acaba por ser algo que eu precisava tanto ter aqui ao pé de mim. Há tanta gente que tem tanto dinheiro, com esse dinheiro que há a ajudar o próximo. Não há esse? Há cada um das pess